different songs as we get started tonight. We're going to sing, first of all, it's a little short song entitled, O God, Our Help, in Ages Past, Our Hope for Years to Come. It's an Isaac Watts song, an old song from Isaac Watts. And so let's go ahead and sing that together. We'll sing several of these verses together tonight, and then we'll open in a word of prayer. Let's sing together, O God, Our Help, in Ages Past, number 122.
but that's what happens when you don't sing the song much. So let's sing this fifth verse.
Bibles to Revelation chapter 7 as we continue in our series together, uh, as we consider the Lord working in this passage. Again, the theme verse is Revelation chapter 1 verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. The things which thou hast seen is found in chapter number 1, the vision that John sees of the Lord Jesus Christ and we see the Lord working and moving in a great and mighty way. And then in chapters 2 and 3, we think, see the things that are. The letters to the seven churches of Asia, Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos and Thyatira and Philadelphia and, and all those churches, Laodicea as well and others. And we see in chapters 2 and 3 these letters to these seven churches. But then we see in chapter 4, the future, uh, after the rapture, this, it says, after this I behold, after this. And so this is the future events that we see, and I believe what we see even going on around us today with different earthquakes, with different um, you know, pestilences and diseases and different things like that. We're seeing a preparation. God's trying to get folks' attention to see that there is an important truth. They must receive Christ before it's too late. Then we saw after the rapture is given, the story of the Lord's coming, glory is given to the Lord in verse number 11 of chapter 4. And then in chapter 5, we see there's a predicament. Uh, that no one's found worthy to open the seven sealed scroll or to open those seals thereof. And then we see the predicament is solved as the lion of the tribe of Judah and the Lamb of God is the one who's found worthy to open up this seven sealed scroll. And then we saw, as we consider this passage, that the Lord again is glorified, the Lord again is praised and exalted and worshipped and honored and magnified. And then we continue looking at the tribulation period in chapter 6, the Antichrist, the false peace, the violence and war and bloodshed with the red horse appearing, the third seal with the famine and uh, the black horse, uh, the fourth seal with the pale horse with the fourth of one of the world's population being wiped out. Then we saw the fifth seal opened and the souls killed for the gospel's sake were seen and the saints receiving the white robes. And then the sixth seal opened and there's an earthquake, the sun and the moon are changed, the stars fall to the earth and the heaven is moved, the islands and mountains are moved, and the kings and the men hide themselves in the dens and in the rocks, the mountains, and they are so concerned because the wrath of God was come, and they did not want to face the wrath of God. They would rather that the rocks and mountains would fall upon them than that they would have to face the divine judgment from Almighty God. And that's a terrible thing. No one wants to die, I don't believe, by a rock or a mountain falling upon them. But we see this time coming, and then we looked at the appearance of the angels in verses 1 through 3, and uh, this passage of scripture, and we see the angel appearing, and we talk about the authentication, and, and so forth. And, but I want us to continue tonight by looking, beginning in verse 4, and we'll read down through the end of the chapter, down through verse number 17, and then we'll look at the Jewish people that are sealed, and what God is doing here in this particular passage of scripture. And so we see that uh, tonight, and so we thank the Lord for that. I've got two glasses of water up here tonight. <laughs> Amen. And so uh, we thank the Lord for just the privilege to be in the Word of God. Let's look, if you would please, beginning in verse 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Nephilim were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manassas were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. After this, verse 9, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number. Notice, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. Verse 11, And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne of their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto fountains, living fountains of waters, and 
God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Let's bow together for prayer, and then I'll look at this message tonight in the second portion of Revelation 7. Father, thank you for the privilege to be able to be gathered together around your word tonight. And Lord, we realize how vital your word is, how important your word is. Lord, many in our world today would just to put uh, no priority at all upon the word of God. But Lord, just as I heard a preacher even giving a devotion this morning about setting a fire and, and, and putting ourselves to just get into the book, get into the word of God. Lord, help us to realize the preeminence and the priority and the precious power of the precious word of God. Lord, as we open it and as we are allowing your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us, I pray that you'd speak to us from your word tonight and that you challenge us to be in your word every single day, studying it and reading from it, Lord, even as we are reminded again and again to do it, even as individuals will remind us of that day by day to, to be in the precious scriptures. Lord, bless, we pray, our time together, and we'll thank you for what you will do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You notice as we begin tonight, number two, in verses four through eight, we see the sealing of the Jewish people. The sealing of these Jewish people in verses 4 through 8. Now we notice, first of all, under this, that the total number is 144,000. 144,000. Now I want you to think about that. These are going to be witnesses to those left behind on the earth that don't go to be with the Lord during the rapture. Now, during the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, I believe that these evangelists, now again, as we mentioned, chapter 7 is kind of a parenthesis. It's going on and, and all during the time of the judgments that we see in the chapter previous. And so as we see what's happening during the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, I believe these evangelists, these that are sealed from the, the, the Jewish evangelists, as it were, that will uh, come to the Lord, uh, that they will be preaching about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in chapter number 6, we realize, I believe part of this, as we see in chapter 6, remember verses 15 through 17, remember as we looked at that just a little while ago, and as we briefly recounted that in chapter number 6 and verses 15 through 17, it speaks specifically about the fact that these individuals, the, the kings of the earth, and, and the great men, and the chief captains, and these mighty men, and all these individuals, that they're going to cry out because they know that the wrath of God is coming. Now, how do they know that it's God's wrath that's coming? I believe part of it is because of the witness of these particular witnesses, of these particular ones who are sealed in these tribes of the Jews that are going to power, powerfully and very strongly proclaim the message of the gospel. Now, let me just say this as we consider the gospel message. Uh, I believe the church, I'm not talking about just today, but I believe the church as a whole has not got the job done of getting the gospel to the world. Not just our generation, but from Pentecost until today, you have whole continents in darkness, spiritually speaking. And so we see uh, these witnesses. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about that in just a moment. Now, we notice the individuals from the tribes in verses 5 through 8 speaks about these particular uh, truths here. The Bible says 12,000 from Judah. Now, why is Judah mentioned first? Now, I believe it is because the Lord Jesus Christ is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. That Christ is mentioned first. Christ gets all the preeminence. And so the tribe of Judah is mentioned first. But then we see Reuben and Gad and Asher and, and Naphtalim and Manassas and Simeon and, and Levi and Issachar and Zebulun and Joseph and Benjamin and all these different individuals. As we consider these tribes, we notice a couple of the tribes are excluded. Now, Dan, the tribe of Dan is excluded. Why was it excluded? Well, maybe it's because it was one of the tribes to go to idolatry. As Judges 18, verse 30 says, And they of the tribe, the children of Dan, set up the graven image. So they were involved in idolatry. But then we see in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 17 uh, that Ephraim also is excluded. As Hosea chapter 4 says, Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. Remember, Jeroboam was an Ephrathite who lifted up his hand against the king and 1 Kings 11, 26. Let's look back there briefly. Hold your place in Revelation. 1 Kings chapter 11. We see these two tribes are not listed among these tribes that are given here, specifically 1 Kings chapter number 11. And if you'll consider with me 1 Kings 11, verse number 26. 
1 Kings 11, verse 26, the Bible says, And Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephrathite of Zeretta, of Solomon's servant, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow woman, even he left of his hand against the king. And so we see this, because of these sins, because of the idolatry, Ephraim and Dan were excluded from these 12 tribes that are listed here because of sin. Now let me just pause for a moment and give an application. We're not saying this is what this passage is saying, but by way of an application, sin will exclude you from the blessings that God wants to give you. I think about a parent and children. Now, have you ever seen this with a, a parent? Uh, you know, a parent wants to do something nice and, and, and something special for their kids. And, and I heard a story of one time, one father, you know, was looking, you know, his kids had just talked about some things that they really, really wanted and some things they really would have enjoyed at the store, maybe some special, you know, special foods or special treats or whatever the case may be. And so the father goes to the store and he's all excited about being able to get these foods for his, his young people, his, his children, and uh, he's getting so excited, he's, he's ordering these different things and putting them in the shopping cart, and he goes and, 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 and he comes home, and uh, his kids know what's in the package, they kind of can tell, but as soon as he comes inside that door, uh, the kids, uh, the mother uh, tells the dad that these kids have not been acting right, they've not been behaving, they've been very well, very poorly behaved or misbehaving, whatever the word is here tonight, I don't know. And so we consider this as uh, they were facing all this, he, he, they look at him and, and uh, he's not able to, 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 he says, I was going to give all this to you, but I'm not going to do it right now because you have not been responding properly. And you think about this tonight, God has certain blessings that he desires to pour out upon us, but God can't bless a people that have turned away from the Lord. God can't bless us if we have sin in our hearts. As in Isaiah, Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I have pride, if I have bitterness, if I have unforgiveness, if I have wrong motives and wrong thoughts and wrong responses in my life and I've not gotten them taken care of, God cannot bless with certain things that he wants to bless. He says, I want to pour out these blessings upon you, but I'm not able to do that until you confess your sin and until you take care of that. I think about America and all the sins of America. God, I believe, would like to, 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 to show mercy and give blessing, but he cannot bless wickedness. He cannot bless sin. He cannot bless departure from the Lord. And so we consider that these couple of tribes, Dan specifically and Ephraim, are not mentioned here. And I believe it's because of sin uh, against the Lord. But I want us to consider then also, and not only we consider the, the, the individuals from these 12 tribes, but I want us to see thoroughly the praise to God in heaven in verses 9 through 12. The praise to God in heaven. Look, if you would please, at verse 9 of chapter 7. It says this, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number. Notice, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Now, I want you to pause for a moment. This great multitude begins to praise the Lord. Now, the witnesses, I believe, during this time of tribulation, are going to tell the gospel message to many people, and there will be multitudes, I do believe, that will get saved. Now, multitudes, we know, will also die a martyr's death at the hands of the Antichrist. And as we see in verse number 9, that after this, after all this is happening, John sees these tribulation saints that are saved, that are redeemed, and they will be saved during the tribulation period. Now I want you to consider, though, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is a strong warning for those boldly and bluntly rejecting the gospel message. If you're happening to watch this video tonight and you don't know Jesus as Savior and you have rejected the Lord and you've rejected the working of the Lord, let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 to 12. Well, I want you to get this. This is important tonight. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 7, the Bible says this, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Think about this. Right now, in the time when he, Paul was speaking to these Thessalonian believers, the mystery of iniquity, the working of sin and Satan, was already at work. And it's been at work, and it is at work today. But notice, verse 7, let's consider the rest of the verse, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. 
Now, who is the one that is hindering the work of the, of the devil and is working? We know we have God that does not work, that hinders the work of Satan, right? But we have one person in the Trinity. Who can name it out for me? You can't shout out tonight. Well, you can, but I can't hear you. We know we have God the Father, we have God the Son, and we have God the Holy Spirit. Now, what does the Bible say about the ministry of the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit reproves of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. The Holy Spirit works in people's hearts. The Holy Spirit convicts people of sin, shows them their need for a Savior. Don't we think about this today? He's the one that is working, though Satan is already working. Now, what does it say? Until the Holy Spirit, he, the Holy Spirit, be taken out of the way. Now, when the rapture happens, the trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ rise first, we which are alive remain, be caught up together with the Lord in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. When that rapture happens, at the moment that we go to be with the Lord, though that's the end of the church age when the rapture happens, and when that rapture takes place, and when we today who are a part of the church age, when we, the church, if you're a believer, the true in other words, I'm speaking of true local New Testament churches, but we refer specifically when God takes away the bride of Christ, the Bible says at that point, at that time, then the wicked is going to be revealed. Verse 8, now that word wicked is capitalized. That wicked, I believe, is the Antichrist who's going to be revealed he may be alive today. He's not revealed yet. We don't know who the Antichrist is yet. He may be, if the Lord's coming is very soon, he's alive today. I don't know for sure. It depends on when the Lord's going to return. But if the Lord is going to return very soon, the Antichrist is living today, I would believe. And so as we consider this, it says that wicked or the Antichrist, he's going to be revealed who he is, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And you think about this, at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, even him who is working or whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Notice, because they receive not the love of the truth. Now, this time, right now, people have opportunity to receive the love of the truth, to realize they're a sinner, to realize there's a penalty for sin, to realize that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again to pay the penalty for our sin. And that's the great message, you know, people talking about, and this is good, you know, providing uh, ventilators to those that need ventilators, providing, you know, different, different things to those with various sicknesses and diseases. But let me remind us today that as important as some ventilator may be to some people, or as important as some uh, medicine may be to some people, even more important tonight, let me remind us tonight that the most important message we must share is about Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us not be ashamed to tell others about Christ because he is the greatest answer to anyone's need tonight. He is the answer to any virus or any other situation that could ever happen economically or politically or whatever. Jesus is the answer. Now, I'm waiting for Facebook to decide to go off again. <laughs> I don't want it to, but I'm waiting as I say, Jesus is the answer. I mean, he's more important than anybody else or anyone else. Uh, you realize tonight that Christ is the answer. But notice that the Bible says uh, that, uh, that those that have not believed the love of the truth. Now, you have an opportunity now, right now, and I'd encourage you to even to share this uh, with somebody. That, hey, you need to receive Christ before it is eternally too late, folks. You need to receive Jesus. And he's begging you, he's pleading with you to come to Jesus, come and be saved tonight. Come and receive the love of the truth. But the Bible says if they don't get saved and that trumpet sounds and the, the, the church is out of here and the Holy Spirit's work is, is, is gone with, the, with the, the church being gone, the one who now led it is, is taken out of the way and the Antichrist is revealed and, and the Antichrist is working and and the power of Satan with all the lying wonders and deceivableness and false peace and all those sorts of things, that one world government, we see all of the, this all coming into place and all preparing for the, 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 the Antichrist to appear and to be made known on the scene. We see it all falling into place 
and the Lord knows all about it. And so we see, though, that those, verse 11, for this cause, the Bible says, God, what? Shall send them strong delusion that they shall believe a lie, that they all might be damned to believe not the truth, but had pleasure in righteousness. Those today who think it's okay to kill babies and to, to be homosexual and to do all these wicked things and to be involved in all these things that the world would say, oh, it's not politically correct to speak out, but we must speak out. We want the politicians to speak out uh, uh, against uh, the, the wickedness of, of our world. We must stand up. And I was even listening to a conference call with some preachers and some uh, Rince Priebus, I think is his name, uh, there this week. And uh, th just, uh, just thinking about how we as believers in churches, the pastors have to stand up and proclaim if we want the politicians too as well to stand up and, 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 and share the truth and so forth. But we consider this tonight uh, that those who believe the lie, those who believe the lie are those that have rejected the Lord. The Lord's given them an opportunity to repent. They say no. The Lord's given them another opportunity to come to Christ. They say, no, the rapture takes place. The church is out of here. The Holy Spirit's influence is out of here. They're going to believe the lie. All those who were in church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and rejected the Lord Jesus, these evangelists won't reach them. Uh, these evangelists will not be able to see them come to Christ. These people will believe the lie. But the folks who've never heard the gospel, I believe, will have opportunity through the working of these Jewish evangelists that are sealed uh, to be able to receive Jesus Christ as Savior. Now notice what happens about these individuals. In verse 9, they're dressed in white robes. This indicates their purity. And we thank God for this. Uh, we think about the fact that they also, in verse 9, had palms in their hands. Now, remember, as we celebrated at Palm Sunday, palms, uh, the palm trees, symbolize victory. And there is victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they cry out, verse 10, with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Salvation to our God. He is the one that gives salvation. And we see the elders and beasts praise God in verse 11 and 12. The Bible says, excuse me, and all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, notice, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever, amen. Think about it. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might, all these things, this sevenfold praise. Now think about this today. We must give God blessing. We must bless the Lord. The Bible says, bless the Lord of my soul and all uh, that is within me, bless his holy name. We need to give him blessing and praise him. We need to give him glory, thanking him, praising him for all that he's done. We need to give him wisdom. He is the source of wisdom. If any of you lack wisdom, James 1, 5 says, let me ask of God. You need wisdom on what to do. Spend some time alone with the Lord in prayer. Ask God. Say, Lord, reveal to me. Show me in your time and your plan exactly what to do in this situation. That's so important. But then thanksgiving, giving God thanks, thanking him and giving him honor and, and exalting in him and realizing that he is worthy. Of, he is the one that's powerful and mighty. And he is, the, he is the amen, and he is the first and the last, amen. Thank the Lord for that. But I want us to conclude tonight with number four, the discourse with the elder. The discourse with the elder. Verse 13, we see the question asked. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, who's me? I believe John is the, the human penman, so he's speaking to John. And the elder says to John, what are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? So if we haven't figured out who it is, and we kind of already explained who they were, these tribulation saints, but if you haven't already figured it out, uh, John basically says, Sir, thou knowest. Now, how many of you have ever been asked a question? You say, well, you know the answer to that. Or, tell me. Okay? Uh, so he tells them. He says unto me, verse 14, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Think about this. Those that, uh, that, that, that get saved during the tribulation period because of these 144,000 Jewish witnesses that proclaim the gospel message, I believe these witnesses will witness, and those who've never heard the gospel will be saved. Now again, those who've rejected Jesus today, they will not have opportunity. They've had opportunity now. And if you're one of those who's rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, you've never received him, let me encourage you, your time to receive Christ is between now till the rapture. You need to trust Christ today. You need to stop rejecting the Lord because one day the knee will bow and the tongue will confess, but it's at that day it's going to be too late if you have not received him today, if you've rejected him and purposefully re rejected the message of salvation. 
But we see this passage of scripture that these are the martyrs. They had uh, they had uh, died, as it were, some of these that had died for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ, slaughtered during the tribulation period. Now, aren't you glad you're saved? Now, what we're saying is our world, I believe, today is just seeing just a glimpse of what's going to happen in the tribulation period. You think this is a pestilence? Now, I believe, and I'm not going to get into all my beliefs and my viewpoints. That's not necessary because I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a doctor. But I do believe that if this virus is still around and there's not herd immunity or a population immunity or whatever the case is, and it goes away maybe some during the summer, it could come back in the fall and be a lot worse with the flu season beginning and the, the beginning of the flu season, all that sort of thing. Now, am I trying to scare everybody? No. But I'll just say, even if that were to happen and come back worse, it's still nothing compared to a quarter of the world's population being wiped out as we saw in the seal judgments here in Revelation chapter 6. Those that have rejected the Lord, rejected the Lord, rejected the Lord, and the judgment comes. And so we think about this. Judgment and wrath is coming. And preachers and some others have tried to warn others in our country that they need to turn to Jesus before it's too late, but many times... The, the world tries to shut them down. I've even heard stories that sometimes Facebook will censor certain things or, or the Google, I was listening to the pastor's call, and this is a true statement, I believe, really is true. Facebook and Google and other places will censor stuff, and if they hear certain things they don't think to be correct, they'll, you know, make the population uh, not easily see your website or your Facebook page, your posts, or whatever the case may be, so you're not reaching as many people. Now, that's censorship, but it's going on even in America, believe it or not. And so, Facebook, if you're watching, I don't agree with that, okay? <laughs> uh, all right, so think about this tonight. I say Facebook, I'm speaking about the corporation, not those watching, all right? But uh, we think about this tonight, that there's a lot that's going on. And if you think it's bad now with the influence of the Holy Spirit... And if you think it's bad now with the influence of the church, no matter how lukewarm we may be as a whole, and I pray that this helps us as a church, that we might not be lukewarm, that Wednesday night we'd be having a full house prayer meeting. We'd be really praying that come fall that we don't have a big outbreak of the virus and everybody dies, you know, whatever. Pray that God might show mercy. I believe, I'm not trying to scare anybody, but I believe we need to be motivated to pray. What's it going to take to get our attention to get in the house of the Lord when we can? And uh, so the Lord wants to work in our hearts. And so we think about this tonight. Uh, the answer is given. And then we saw uh, that these have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Look, if you would, at John chapter 10, verses 15 through 16. John chapter 10, verses 15 through 16. I think about that song, Washed in the blood of the Lamb. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. This great company of people, they're not part of the church. They're part of the tribulation saints. Now, the church age is... After when the church began until the time of the rapture. These are the tribulation saints we're speaking of here that have washed the blood of the Lamb that are being spoken of here. And the Bible says in John chapter 10, look at verses 15 and 16, and then we'll look back at John 14. John 10, 15 and 16 says, As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. There are others that are going to be saved, they're not part of the church age, others that are not going to be saved, they're not part uh, uh, of the Old Testament, those that were believers or saved, or those that came to, to, know, to look forward to, to the Lord Jesus but, and to the Messiah. But we consider this passage of Scripture that, look at John 14. Verses 2 and 3 as we come to our close tonight. John 14, 2 and 3. This is an encouraging thought. Let's read verses 1 through 3. John 14, 1 through 3. The Bible says, Let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. And my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now think about this. When the Lord Jesus Christ calls us to be with him in heaven, and then the tribulation period will go on, we'll be with the Lord in heaven. Others will be on earth during the tribulation period because we'll be with him where he is, where we will be also. Then when he returns at the millennial reign, we'll come back with him to rule and reign with him for the thousand-year reign. And what a wonderful day that's going to be. But I want you to close, we'll close tonight 
by looking at the last couple of verses. So these are the tribulations Satan spoken of in these verses, verse 14 and 15. But I want you to look at verses 15 through 17. We see the position and the condition of those wearing the robes as we close. The Bible says, Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of them, or midst of the throne, shall feed them, and shall lead them into the fountains of living waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Those serve the Lord before his throne. No hunger, no thirst. Tears wiped away. And I believe that's so wonderful, not just for these tribulation saints, but I believe for all believers as we are with the Lord in heaven. No more sickness, sadness, sorrow, or crying. So let me encourage you. I don't know what's going to happen in America. But I believe that God's trying to get folks' attention. And will God have to try to get folks' attention in a little even greater way if they don't receive the Lord? Now, wouldn't that be great if God's got somebody's attention? They face some serious sickness, but they came and turned to Jesus as Savior before it was too late, and they could face a home in heaven. That would be so much greater than them facing just a perfect life in this life and die and go to hell. Think about it. Let me encourage you. We need to be sharing the good news of the gospel we can't be lukewarm. We can't be half-hearted. We can't be, oh, well, you know, Jesus saved, but, you know, somebody else can tell my neighbor. Oh, you know, Jesus saved, but somebody else can share you with know, a Facebook post with some, you know, someone or invite somebody to, to know the Lord as Savior. Somebody else can do that. I don't need to do everything I can. But the Lord says, no, we need to be faithful to share the gospel with others. And so we saw today the appearance of the angels. We saw the sealing of these Jews. We saw the praise to God in heaven. We saw the discourse that's given that those that come out of the tribulation are washed by the blood of the Lamb and they are serving God. No more thirst, no more hungering, uh, no more tears, no more crying. And thank God that Jesus still saves. There may be tears and tribulation in this world, but Jesus has overcome the world. Fear not. Trust in Him. So today, if you've rejected Christ, if you know a family member or a friend or someone who says, I'm an atheist, I'm an agnostic, I don't believe in God. I don't believe that Jesus is the Savior. Let me encourage you. Beg with them. Plead them. Pray for them that they might be saved because they still have opportunity. But if they don't receive Christ, if someone doesn't receive Christ and they reject him, they reject him, and they reject him, and they reject him, the Bible says, oh, okay, I've given you a warning. Here's revelation. Here's the story. This is what's going to happen. That those that have not heard the gospel, they'll have opportunity to be saved during this time. But those that have heard the gospel, rejected it, rejected it, rejected it, rejected it. They will believe the lies we saw in the, second, in the book of Thessalonians. And so let me encourage you, let's be a witness, and let's truly pray tonight for lost friends, neighbors, loved ones, others to be saved. It's a serious thing. Satan wants to make us think of eh, more important things than that. Virus is more important than somebody's salvation.